Hey there. Hi. We are live for the first time. Yay. My Two Cents Editing, Megan Pinson, my boss. <laughs> Matthew Arkin, my lead story editor. <laughs> so that was our first little video that we've put together. That you put together. You that did I the put thing that was amazing. But everything in there I learned from you. So uh, I don't know. I think there was a lot of coronavirus uh, quarantine skills that went into that. I had nothing to do with. Oh no, but I mean the con the content. The content uh -huh. I learned. A lot of that I learned. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I learned it from you or learned how to put it into words while I was working for you. Yeah, there's a big difference between sort of being able to identify that something is wrong and being able to figure out how to um, express how to fix it. So I think you did a really nice job in that video. It's hard to explain, make your prose more active um, in a brief comment in the manuscript. So more of a long form like this works better. Right. Yeah. Well, it's fun. It's fun. I, I have all, I love going down rabbit holes, which is one of the reasons <laughs> no, I made the video. The <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it's fun to break literature down into these little micro problems mm -hmm. and think, okay, let's just address how we do this one little thing better. Yeah. Oh, my friend Richard Soto just joined us. Nice. He's a writer and actor extraordinaire and a teacher also. Uh, so what what drew you to editing to begin with? What, what got you started in that? Um, I got lucky and um, I worked really hard. I was on, <laughs> I was simultaneously on maternity leave and laid off from teaching in Los Angeles Unified School District. Right. And um, about a year into being a stay-at-home mom, I was losing my mind. And all of these people started sending me things to edit. My neighbor was working on screenplays and my brother was working on a business plan. A friend was working on some marketing materials for a hair salon she was starting. Um, so I just kind of found myself editing all the time. Hi, Richard. Um, and then I, uh, a friend of mine sent me some stories to work on and he said that the feedback that I gave was really helpful and I should see if I could make some money at this because I was not going back to teaching high school. Right. Um, so I checked out Craigslist and there were a lot of people doing, offering editing services and their ads were terrible and had a bunch of errors in them. And I thought, these idiots can do this. I'm going to mop up. <laughs> so um, that was 10 years ago. I've learned quite a bit since then. That's a problem when you're an editor and you have typos in your ad. Yeah, you would think that that would get caught before you hit publish, but no. No. And, you know... Time is very humbling because I have published plenty of things on the blog, on the website that have had errors in it. So you can't really feel too superior about it for very long. Well, I always find that I, I have to have somebody else's eyes on it Yeah. because I think that I have done something that I haven't. Yeah. Or I think that I haven't done something that I have. Um, you you actually I think saved my my literal life not not just my my literary life but my literal life. How so? Uh, because I had that one error <laughs> in my manuscript that so I think forever go unnamed. Yeah, will forever go unnamed. But it's the kind of thing that could have gotten me killed, and it was a completely innocent mistake of, of thinking that a word that sounded like it had one root yeah. actually meant something else. Yeah. And, um, and I could have gotten into big trouble completely, <laughs> completely in a completely innocent way. And, and you, you saved me with the very 
delicate comment in the margin saying, I don't think this word means what you think it means. Yeah. And I went, hmm. Let's take that out. Did a little research and <laughs> realized, oh my God. Yeah. That's why I think it's so important to um, be reading constantly as an editor. And did did you read that one, Carrie? <laughs> she she read an early draft of, of the novel and and knew knew about that. Yeah, I love those moments because they just live between the writer and the editor. <laughs> just. You're the only one that would ever bring that up. I would never yeah. bring that up. No, I know you would never bring it up, but I, I feel like uh, I feel like that's an instructive story of how how important it is to get other eyes on uh, on your work. Yeah, and and informed eyes. And you know, I'm I'm not qualified to edit a lot of things, and you're not edit qualified to edit a lot of types of work. But the things that we read a ton of and are really well versed in, we're, you know, we have informed opinions about those. So I that's part of what just drives me to be reading all the time in all the different areas I'm interested in so that I can um, be useful. Talk about that a little bit. You know, I know there's this this. Uh... You know, there's this new thing in the in the film and theater world, which I spend a lot of time in, which are uh, is the um, the intimacy coach, which are these people who come on to set and make sure that when an intimate scene is being filmed, that everybody is OK. Oh, and like the consent police or something. It, it, it's not just a literal consent release, but it's just making sure that the actor, the actors have somebody to talk to about what they are comfortable, somebody advocating on their behalf That's about cool. nudity and That's all of those other things. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole new thing that has sprung up. Um, and in literature, I know that you acquainted me with this concept that I was unfamiliar with, the sensitivity reader. Right. Um, and I know I, this may not qualify as a sensitivity reader, but I know that you just recently hired somebody very interesting because of a particular angle that was needed on a on a particular manuscript. Yeah, it's interesting. Some you know authors will sometimes um, be wanting to know how something comes across to an audience that they're not part of, um, and for Authenticity readers, it might be, you know, someone with lived experience in um, a particular like culture or experience or whatever. So it might be, you know, you'd, you've got, say, um, an American Indian character, a Native American character, but you're a white lady from the Midwest. Well, and there, there's an example right there, a Native American character as opposed to an American Indian character. Right. Like, which language do you use? Right. I'm not qualified to answer that question in 2020. You know, maybe in 2010, I might have been. Right. But um, my experience isn't primary. So um, in order to give someone really useful feedback, um, you know, we try to find people who, you know, love to, you know, there are a lot of authenticity readers out there at this point. Uh, it's not always easy to find them. And I don't actually um, work with them when someone needs an authenticity reader. Then I generally send them to my friend and colleague, Sunny Cooper at Sun Literary. We had a company together for a few years, Outrider Literary, and then just kind of, um, we both like to be the boss. So <laughs> really it's that I'm bad at cooperating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, she's, She's got a lot of readers um, who do that. And she had a big project last year for a publisher who needed a lot of these readers. And she managed that beautifully. So um, for me, I tend to go more towards like, like professional beta readers, a particular um, demographic or like skill set or something like that. You just hired somebody really cool on one of those. I 
you can, I'm not going to divulge the identity of my beta readers. You can. <laughs> In this case, you're in this to go. case, yeah. my my son fit the the demographic that was needed, yeah. um, and I I am always willing to be a sensitivity reader for somebody who's concerned about the feelings of middle aged Jewish men living in Los Angeles. I can right. I can uh, read from that point of view pretty well. Okay, with <laughs> with a law background. With a law, but yeah, yeah, like. Film industry experience, New yeah. York City. Okay, I'll keep you in mind for that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should we? I don't know. I can't see from my end um, if people are still around. So I'm just going to let you. Leave. Yeah, we have uh, we have a bunch of people watching uh, on YouTube and Facebook. So uh, I'd love to open it up to any questions that people have for. Megan, or for me, about editing work in general, or the editing work that we do. Um, we have uh, we've been working together for well, we we, we had an uh, an interesting meet cute uh, story uh, where we were uh, next to each other working at adjacent uh, tables at Star Starbucks, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we started talking and uh, you gave me your card and uh, I said, you oh, I the only table by a um, plug and my laptop was dying. Oh, I was waiting for my car for my oil change across the street and Sherman Oaks. Oh, that's so, what it was. Yeah. I asked you if I could share your table um, because oh. I needed, I needed the outlet you were next to. Gotcha. <laughs> we started okay. talking. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I, I I said, oh, I have a manuscript that's going to need editing one of these days, and and you rolled your eyes. I did as, not. No, you did. <laughs> no, you very politely said, mm hmm. But inside, as we all do, you know, everybody says, oh, I have a I have a book. Um, right. It's it's something I remember from growing up in New York. Every cabbie had a story to tell. Yeah. Yeah, I think you were the only person that I've met in real life who was like, I'm writing a book, and then came back to me later that I didn't meet at a writing conference. At a writing thing. Yeah, and then, like and at then, a coffee shop, just out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Book, and then you did, and then you hired me, and then I hired you. And then you hired me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so and, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. I want to know if anyone... Um, we do have a question. Just oh, came cool. in. Yeah. I want to know if anyone has had trouble with the gerunds and the active language um, issue that your video is about. Oh, okay. Uh, so if anybody has questions about that, uh, pop in on the comments and we will address that. Uh, but Richard Soto has a question here. Uh, well, he wants to know, when do you recommend offering one's work to an editor as the work progresses or at the end of a draft? That's a really good question. Um, it depends on how you like to work, um, which can be tough to know if you've never worked with an editor before, but you'll kind of have a feeling what sounds right. If you want someone's um, eyes on it before you finish and maybe go in a direction that isn't as you know destined for success as a different one might be, um, then while you're working on the draft might be a good idea. And that early look of an unfinished draft can alert you to issues like um, writing habits, like using a lot of passive language or gerunds, um, just kind of show you your favorite mistakes and show you a different way of doing it that may really change the way you write the rest of it and save you a lot of trouble later. Um, if you would rather, like, a lot of people really like to protect that writing process as this kind of magical, mystical time that who knows where that inspiration comes from, um, but you don't want to mess with it. You know, if you're one of those people, wait until you've got a finished draft and then hand it over and then start talking with someone about it. Um, because that can feel a lot safer. It really just depends on kind of your style of collaborating. Right. 
Um, and obviously showing an early draft, it's going to be, uh, the editor will have less feedback on whether your plot holds together as a whole, because they're not, they're not able to see, see the entire thing, but they can certainly give feedback on, Hey, this beginning does not hook me. You know, where's, where's your story and where does it really start? And I think what can be really helpful at the beginning is having a conversation with an editor about the concept of the book. What is this story about? Whose story is it? Why are you writing it? Because being really clear on those can save you a ton of time and revision later. A lot of times when people write just kind of straight through like for NaNoWriMo maybe, or you're a pantser and you're just kind of seeing what comes out, um, what comes out tends to be unfocused. And that's fine if you're doing it because you love the process, that can be plenty. But if your dream is to land an agent and get published, you really should think clearly about the concept of the book before you've got 100,000 words to try and figure out what you've just done. Right. It's like when I'm working with my screenwriting students, um, we start with the log line, which is one sentence. Give me your movie in one sentence. Not the whole story, but I want to know who the protagonist is in a noun adjective pair so that I know something. And, and I don't mean a young man or an old woman. That doesn't tell right. me anything. But in a way that tells me about this person, yeah. what do they want and what's in the way? I don't need to know the end, but you have to, you have to make me, you have to be able to craft one sentence that stops me in my tracks and makes me say, oh, now tell me the paragraph. Right. And then that and paragraph you, will make me say, oh, now I want to read the screenplay. Right. And if you can't come up with a sentence, um, that can indicate a problem, but you could find that out at the very end of a book or at the beginning. Uh, sure thing. Thanks for your question. That was a good one. Yeah. Keep them coming. We like, uh, we like questions. We talk to each other all the time. So uh... <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> um, well, uh, if there aren't any other questions, I think we can wrap this up. This was okay. our first broadcast of these. We have another one coming up uh, about beta readers as soon as I can finish editing it. Uh, it's an interesting quarantine learning process. I decided to teach myself this editing and uh, uh, the first one took seven weeks to edit. No, uh, <laughs> it, it didn't. Oh, we did get a question here, another okay. question. Do you think it's better to outline or to write the first draft by the seat of your pants? I would ask some questions. Um, I think it depends on the person. So are you willing to be interviewed by me right now in your face, New Yorker? Um, my first question would be, have you started a novel? Do you have something that we're actually talking about or is this hypothetical? And then the next question would be, um, if you've already started something, if you're writing it by the seat of your pants, are you enjoying it? How's the writing coming? Um, is it flowing well? Does it feel good to you? Um, if it's not, why? And how is it feeling? Is it feeling like murky and confusing or frustrating? Um, is it feeling like you're lost? You know, are you gonna have an existential crisis at the end of this if you push through to the end of the month? Yes to all. I just covered a lot of bases. <laughs> uh, well, she did say she started writing it. So okay. it's not it's not done yet. Okay. Um if it's feels good to do it like that, then, you know, stick with it and go and, um, and see how it goes. If it is not working, 
I would sort of pump the brakes and start to outline what you have, what, you know, what's your 40,000 words in? That's a good start. So, so that's maybe halfway through a, a novel of whatever genre, it depends. Uh, it, it's a novel, right? Yeah, it's a novel. Um, Either that or a very long short story. <laughs> <laughs> it can be like just the right length for a novella though. That's true. So, um, I think it can be helpful to get started by just going with it because you get this flash of inspiration and then you, you get it down. But if you're starting, if you're in the middle and you're not really sure um, about something, going through some outlining exercises can help you see the structure that's already there and see what's missing and give you kind of the perspective to um, kind of scaffold your way out of that story. So it's a YA novel, she's telling us. Nice. And more stuff is happening. Okay. Um, yeah, the stuff, the stuff that I write, um, I, I find that I have to do a certain, certain amount, not necessarily of outlining, but of figuring out what the heck happened before because I'm writing mysteries. Yeah. So I need to know everything I can about the event that the detective is investigating. Yeah. How he goes about finding it out might develop as the story goes on. But what actually happened has to be pretty clear up here. Yeah. Yeah. And you can kind of backtrack and unravel. A book. Here, will you read that, Matthew? A book, writing your novel from start to finish actually helped me a lot. I did some exercises in there and ended up going off like a runaway train. That's awesome. I think you're in you're in good flow then. Go for yeah. it. Um, writing. That sounds, I would not stop then. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't stop. Don't ever stop writing if you're writing. Um, I don't know about that advice. <laughs> I mean, seriously. So, okay, I'll give context for that. I used to teach a writing workshop that I called um, Creating a Sustainable Writing Practice. And it was a five week workshop that I taught four or five times over a couple of years around like 2012, 13, something like that in Sherman Oaks, Studio City. And <clears throat> What I found, it was sort of a hybrid of um, Natalie Goldberg's writing practice, mm -hmm. like the keep your pen moving, don't stop, don't erase, just go for it. And then David Allen's Getting Things Done book, which is a productivity handbook that I love. I'm kind of a productivity geek. Um, so I made this writing workshop that just like incorporated all these, uh, you know, systems kind of to show up for the muse or whatever. And what I found while teaching that class, um, there were maybe six to eight people in each workshop. Um, some of them would find that they don't like writing, but they have so much baggage about it because they showed an aptitude for it, you know, when they were young and they used to write a lot. Um, and then you go into adulthood and maybe you have kids or maybe you, you know, whatever your life goes on. Um, and they felt so guilty about not writing and it just always bogged them down. Um, and so I realized that like, this was a really great opportunity to give it a chance and give it space and time and attention and love and energy and all of that. And if the answer is, I don't want to, cool. You can let it go and you're done. You have just shed a huge amount of baggage that you don't ever have to worry about again. You can be like, used to love writing, felt bad about it for a long time, really, really tried, didn't like it, I'm done. I do a different thing now. Like, right. That's do a you, good conclusion, I think. 
do you ever, and I, I'm asking this um, knowing what, what my answer is as, as, as an acting teacher, which I've now started to apply to my writing teaching. Um, I, I had the experience when I first started teaching acting of students coming to me who I looked at and I thought, this person will never be an actor and has no business being in an acting class and I wish they would go away. But I couldn't say that to them because I taught at a I taught at an acting school and I was not allowed to say that to people. No. No. But and after a year or two, I would see that person who I thought should go away mm -hmm. get over some hurdle that they had and suddenly I, I thought, oh my God, this person is terrific. And I, it taught me to never, ever, ever say to an acting student, you have no business doing this. Right. Um, cool. as, much as, as, as much as they might give that impression from where they are at the time, yeah. that, that everybody who has the willingness to do what it takes and I don't mean just to do the hard work of sitting down and writing, but the hard work of looking inside, of learning about yourself, of opening your eyes to the world around you, yeah. that you can acquire these tools. Yeah. Um, do you feel the same thing is true about writing? I do. And I have seen writers develop and improve dramatically over the course of several books in series that I worked with them on. Um, and actually, I'm really, it's sort of odd. There are a couple that I worked with for a long time on multiple books, and they kind of outgrew me. At a certain point, they were like, I don't need to afford you anymore. <laughs> and I was like, well, Okay, you know, and you have feelings about that. But years later, looking back, they learned everything that I had to teach them about, okay, here's how you improve dialogue. Here's how you improve using, you know, really bringing the setting to life and, and using your setting details to infuse a scene with mood. So yeah, I do see that. Um, I think that being willing to read a lot and learn how to be a better reader has as much to do with being a better writer as anything else. I mean, you can write until your hands fall off, but if you're not also reading well and wisely and carefully, mindfully, then, um, you know, all you've got is more of the same, most likely. How important is it, do you think, to read in the genre in which you are writing? I think if you want to sell the book that you're writing, it's very important. I'm asking that knowing the answer. I was asking that for for our listeners because I know we've both had the experience of working. I, I have worked with clients who I've, when I've started asking them, what other books in the genre they read. I've been uh, a couple of times I've been told, Oh, I don't like, I don't like science fiction. Right. And, and my response is, well, then you're going to have a problem because you're competing against people who love it. And that's all they read. Yeah. And sci-fi especially is sort of like a genre of connoisseurs, you know, the writers and the readers, they have, these conventions that go deep and wide. Um, thanks, Richard. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think that's really important. I think we should wrap up. Okay. <laughs> we are going to wrap this up. Uh, please take a moment to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, and click the bell icon so that you uh, get notifications of our upcoming live streams. Uh, if you're on the Facebook side of this, then make sure to subscribe at mytwocentsediting.com and uh, subscribe for the newsletter. You'll get interesting articles that Megan writes. And if you go over to my website, matthewarkin.com, 
subscribe to new, my newsletter. You'll also get articles that I write on writing, acting, and the craft of storytelling. So thank you for joining us for the first of these. There will be another one coming up in a week or two. We'll give plenty of notice in which we're going to talk more about beta readers. Yeah. And uh, thank, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I really appreciate it. And Matthew, thank you for making this happen. This is amazing. Thank of you. Of course. Really this fun. was the ball. Talk to you soon. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye-bye.